What do we make of conspiracy theories? The, the phrase itself is tr- pushing you in a direction, right? So, so sure. clearly, in history, there we have had many large coordinated keepings of secrets, right? Say the Manhattan Project, right? And there was a lot of hundreds of thousands of people working on that over many years, but they they kept it a secret, right? Clearly, many large military operations have kept things secrets over you know, even decades with many thousands of people involved. So clearly it's possible to keep some things secret over time periods, Um, you know, but the more people you involve and the more time you are assuming and the more, the, the, the less centralized an organization or the less discipline they have, the harder it gets to believe. But we're just trying to calibrate basically in our minds which kind of secrets can be kept by which groups over what time periods for what purposes, right? But let me, uh, I don't have enough data. So I'm somebody, I, you know, I hang out with people and I love people. I love all things really. And I just, I think that most people, even the assholes have the capacity to be good and they're beautiful and I enjoy them. So the kind of data my brain, whatever the chemistry of my brain is that sees the beautiful in things is maybe collecting a subset of data that doesn't allow me to intuit the competence that humans are able to uh, to uh, achieve in uh, constructing a conspiracy theory. So for example, one, one thing that people often talk about is like intelligence agencies, this like broad thing they say, the yeah. CIA, the FSB, the different, the British intelligence. I've uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough, never gotten a chance that I know of to talk to any member of those intelligence agencies, uh, nor like, uh, take a peek behind the curtain or the first curtain. I don't know how many levels of curtains there are. And so I don't, I can't intuit, but my interaction was with government. I uh, was funded by DOD and DARPA and I've interacted, uh, been to the Pentagon. Like with all due respect to my friends, lovely friends in government, and there are a lot of incredible people, but there is a very giant bureaucracy that sometimes suffocates the ingenuity of the human spirit is one way I can put it. Meaning they are, I just, it's difficult for me to imagine extreme competence at a scale of hundreds or thousands of human beings. Now that doesn't mean that's my very anecdotal data of the situation. And so I, I try to build up my intuition about centralized system of government, how much conspiracy is possible, how much the intelligence agencies or some other source can generate sufficiently robust propaganda that controls the populace. If you look at World War II, as you mentioned, there have been extremely powerful propaganda machines on the, Nazi, on the side of Nazi Germany, on the side of the Soviet Union, on the side of the United States, and all these different uh, mechanisms. Sometimes they control the free press through social pressures. Sometimes they control the press through the threat of violence, you know, as you do in authoritarian regimes. Sometimes it's like deliberately the dictator, like writing the news, (laughs) the headlines and literally announcing it. And uh, something about human psychology forces you to, uh, to embrace the narrative and believe the narrative and at scale that becomes reality when the initial spark was just a propaganda thought in a single individual's mind. So I don't, I can't necessarily intuit of what's possible, but I'm skeptical of the power of human institutions to construct uh, conspiracy theories that uh, cause suffering at scale, especially in this modern age when information is becoming more and more accessible by the populace. Anyway, that's the. I don't know if you can uh, you elucidate it's cause suffering at scale, but of course, say during wartime, the people who are managing the various conspiracies like D-Day or Manhattan Project, they thought that their conspiracy was avoiding harm rather than causing harm. So if you can get a lot of people to think that supporting the conspiracy is helpful, then a lot more might do that. And there's just a lot of things that people just don't want to see. <laughs> So if you can make your conspiracy the sort of thing that people wouldn't want to talk about anyway, even if they knew about it, you're, you know, most of the way there. So 
I have learned many over the years many things that most ordinary people should be interested in, but somehow don't know, even though the data has been very widespread. So, you know, I have this book, The Elephant in the Brain, and one of the chapters is there on medicine. And basically, most people seem ignorant of the very basic fact that when we do randomized trials where we give some people more medicine than others, the people who get more medicine are not healthier. Just overall, in general, just like induce somebody to get more medicine because you just give them more budget to buy medicine, say. Not not a specific medicine, just Mm -hmm. the whole category. And you would think that would be something most people should know about medicine. You you might even think that would be a conspiracy theory to to think that would be hidden. But in fact, most people never learn that fact. So just to clarify, just a general high-level statement, the more medicine you take, the less healthy you are. Randomized experiments don't find that fact. Do not find that more medicine makes you more healthy. There's just no connection. Oh, in randomized experiments, there's no relationship between more medicine. (laughs) So it's not a negative relationship, but it's just no relationship. Right. Uh, And uh, so the 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 conspiracy theories would say that the businesses that sell you medicine don't want you to know that fact. And then you're saying that there's also part of this is that people just don't want to know. They just don't want to know. And so they don't learn this. So, you know, I've lived in the Washington area for several decades now, reading the Washington Post regularly. Every week there was a special, you know, section on health and medicine. It never was mentioned in that section of the paper in all the 20 years I read that. (laughs) So do you think there is some truth to this caricatured blue pill, red pill, where most people don't want to know the truth? Not, not There are many things about which people don't want to know certain kinds of truths. Yeah. That, that is bad looking truths, truths that m- discouraging, truths that sort of take away the justification for things they feel passionate about. Do you think that's a bad aspect of human nature? That's something we should try to overcome? Um, well, as we discussed, my first priority is to just tell people about it, to do the analysis and the cold facts of what's actually happening, and then to try to be careful about how we can improve. So our book, The Elephant in the Brain, co-authored with Kevin Simler, is about how we, hidden motives in everyday life. And our first priority there is just to sh- explain to you what are the things that you are not looking at that you are reluctant to look at. And many people try to take that book as a self-help book where they're trying to improve themselves and, and make sure they look at more things. And that often goes badly because it's harder to actually do that than you think. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so but we at least want you to know that it, that this truth is available if you want to learn about it. It's the Nietzsche, if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. <laughs>